For many years after the settlement of New England the Puritans, even in outwardly tranquil times, went armed to meeting, and to sanctify the Sunday gun loading they were expressly forbidden to fire off their charges at any object on that day save a native or a wolf, their two greatest inconveniences. In 1640 it was ordered in Massachusetts that in every township the attendants at church should carry a competent number of pieces, fixed and complete with powder and shot and swords every Lord's Day to the meeting house. One armed man from each household was then thought advisable and necessary for public safety. In 1642 six men with muskets and powder and shot were thought sufficient for protection for each church. In Connecticut, similar mandates were issued, and as the orders were neglected by divers persons, a law was passed in 1643 that each offender should forfeit 12 pence for each offense. In 1644 a fourth part of the trained hand was obliged to come armed each Sabbath, and the sentinels were ordered to keep their matches constantly lighted for use in their match locks. They were also commanded to wear armor, which consisted of coats basted with cotton wool, and thus made defensive against arrows. In 1650 so much dread and fear were felt of Sunday attack that the Sabbath day guard was doubled in number. In 1692, the Connecticut legislature ordered one-fifth of the soldiers in each town to come armed to each meeting, and that nowhere should be present as a guard at time of public worship fewer than eight soldiers and a sergeant. No details that could add to safety on the Sabbath were forgotten or overlooked by the New Haven Church. Bullets were made common currency at the value of a farthing, in order that they might be plentiful and in everyone's possession. The colonists were enjoined to determine in advance what to do with the women and children in case of attack, so that, as one minister wrote, they do not hang about them and hinder them. The men were ordered to bring at least six charges of powder and shot to meeting. The farmers were forbidden to leave more arms at home than men to use them. It was ordered that the door of the meeting house next the soldiers' seat be kept clear from women and children sitting there, that if there be occasion for the soldiers to go suddenly forth, they may have free passage. The soldiers sat on either side of the main door, a sentinel was stationed in the meeting house turret, and armed watchers paced the streets. Three cannon were mounted by the side of this church militant, which must strongly have resembled a garrison. Military duty and military discipline and regard for the Sabbath, and for the house of God as well, did not always make the well-equipped occupants of these soldier seats in New Haven behave with the dignity and decorum befitting such guardians of the peace and protectors in war. Serious disorders and disturbances among the guard were reported at the General Court on June 16, 1662. One belligerent son of Mars, as he sat in the meeting house, threw lumps from the plastered chinks in the log wall at a fellow warrior, who in turn, very naturally, kicked his tormentor with much agility and force. There must have ensued quite a free fight all around in the meeting house, for Mrs. Goodyear's boy had his head broke that day in meeting, on account of which a woman said she doubted not the wrath of God was upon us. And well might she think so, for divers other unseemly incidents which occurred in the meeting house at the same time were narrated in court, examined into, and punished. In spite of these events in the New Haven Church, which were certainly exceptional, the seemingly incongruous union of church and army was suitable enough in a community that always began and ended the military exercises on training day with solemn prayer and psalm singing. The Salem Sentinels wore doubtles, some of the good English armor owned by the town, each suit costing 24 shillings. Each man bore either a bastard musket with a snaffens, a long fowling piece with musket bore, a full musket, or a barrel with a match cock. Other weapons there were to choose from, mysterious in name, sakers, minions, falcons, rabbinets, murderers, chambers, hark buses, and more. These armed sentinels are always regarded as a most picturesque accompaniment of Puritan religious worship, and the Salem and Plymouth armed men were imposing, though clumsy. In Concord, the men, who all came armed to meeting, stacked their muskets around a post in the middle of the church, while the honored pastor, who was a good shot and owned the best gun in the settlement, preached with his treasured weapon in the pulpit by his side, 
ready from his post of vantage to blaze away at any native whom he saw sneaking without, or to lead, if necessary, his congregation to battle. The men in those old days of the 17th century, when in constant dread of attacks by natives, always rose when the services were ended and left the house before the women and children, thus making sure the safe exit of the latter. This custom prevailed from habit until a late date in many churches in New England, all the men, after the benediction and the exit of the parson, walking out in advance of the women. So also the custom of the men always sitting at the head or door of the pew arose from the early necessity of their always being ready to seize their arms and rush unobstructed to fight. <laughs>